Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Margulies. I am a professor uh, in the law school in the government department uh, here at Cornell. Uh, and I am charged with launching the next uh, talk and panel. I'd like to introduce, we're really very lucky um, to have Mersa Baradaran um, lead off the next session. She is the author, as you see, of a book that came out this year. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Uh, the Color of Money, Black Banks, and the Racial Wealth Gap. Uh, she is a professor uh, at the, uh, of law at the University of California, Irvine. And in order to uh, save as much time for her remarks and then the conversation that she and my colleague Jamila Michener and I will be having afterwards, I will stop right there and let her address you for about 15 minutes. Please join me in welcoming Baris Mercer. Thank you so much for uh, having me. Um, I'm used to talking for more. I'm, I'm going to stick to 15 minutes, so um, just I'm going to talk fast. Um, so the book is about um, the racial wealth gap, and uh, and, and I want to show I, and I show in the book um, how the role of um, credit policies, economic theories, and and banks, uh, bank regulatory frameworks, uh, play in creating and perpetuating it. And I explore why um, the racial wealth gap hasn't abated over time. So at the dawn of uh, emancipation, 1865, the share of black wealth was about 0.5% of the total pie. Um, today, that's about 1, 1.5%. So there's just a staggering amount of a lack of progress. Um, and just to say that our sort of public policy efforts to eradicate it have been a total failure is, is an understatement. Um, but I chose to tell the story uh, of the racial wealth gap using black banks because uh, banks are sort of the engines of the economy. And, and I try to show in the book how in a segregated economy where you have a white banking structure and uh, segregated housing um, and, and black banks trying to build wealth in these communities, that that system just doesn't work. And I'll try to um, go through that in a second. Um, I, I also um, think that this history by studying the attempts at black wealth accumulation, it, it, this um, the history that I, that I try to uh, uh, put forward in the book, um, exposes some of the myths that we tell about markets and how they're supposed to work. And, and I actually think it, it is these myths that uh, present the biggest obstacles uh, in closing the, the racial wealth gap or achieving any sort of economic justice. Um, for example, uh, the promise of segregated banking is one. Um, I'll talk about opportunity zones and all of that hopefully later. Um, uh, the other is uh, just the promise of free market capitalism. And whether you read it in Karl Marx or Adam Smith, the promise of free market capitalism is that it does not discriminate. Uh, free markets offer equal opportunities for all to trade and prosper based on one's skill and ability to uh, produce. Yet history reveals uh, that, in fact, markets do discriminate or alternatively, um, that the American economy has never borne any resemblance uh, to a free market. Uh, for most of our history, uh, blacks have been excluded from occupation schools, neighborhoods, and trades, and their property was not protected by law. And then in each sort of historical moment where actual wealth is being created by these government mechanisms, uh, so Homestead Act, uh, you know, reconstruction, giving away of, um, of wealth, and then the FHA mortgage credit, which we've talked about and I'll touch on briefly, um, blacks were excluded purposefully. Um, uh, so there's this reviving of this progressive era anti-monopoly tradition. I, in a lot of my my cohort, um, we're kind of reviving the spirit of Wilson and 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 uh, Roosevelt, uh, both Roosevelts, and and all of these great um, crusaders of anti-corporations and anti-monopolies. But those are also the very um, progressive heroes who uh, segregated um, housing and uh, the White House, and uh, you know, were some some of them avowed sort of white supremacists. So we have to be careful about what sort of government intervention we are asking for again. Um, so I also want to talk about, and the, the, I'll talk about um, at civil points, uh, several pivot points in history. I go through um, the Reconstruction era in my book. I'm not going to talk about it now. It's 15 minutes is not enough. Um, and then the Civil Rights era, where um, when you have sort of demands by the broader community or the black community specifically asking for economic redress or justice, um, the, the response ends up being a... Um, uh, uh, the, the rhetoric of free market capitalism is used as a weapon. So uh, I'll briefly touch on, so when um, f um, Andrew Johnson vetoes the Freedmen's Bureau bill, that is uh, a, a giving of land um, to the freedmen, um, he's, he does so using um, the free market by saying, 
you know, it's time you, you earn your land and not be, you know, a favored by the laws. And you can go and bargain for wages and uh, the, the markets uh, and the private right of contract uh, will protect you. But what really happens is that the southern economy, including judges, legislatures, uh, legislators um, and lawyers, create new legal codes to prevent uh, that sort of um, thing from happening. There's, uh, you know, cabals between employers and um, uh, the legislatures to cap wages and and uh, the types of contracts that can be entered into. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. So I'm just sorry. This is there's lots in the book. Um, I want to talk about, um, so during the Great Migration northward, this is sort of when the North becomes involved in uh, the history of racism, right? So you, you know, have between 1910 and 1960 or so, you've got, you know, 90, 80 to 90% of, of Southern blacks moving up um, to the North. Um, and when they get there, uh, you are, uh, you know, um, welcome to New York, stay in Harlem, right? So uh, welcome to Chicago, stay on the South Side. It's very heavily segregated. And um, this, this is, the era, this is the, the era where I focus a lot on the balance sheets of these black banks, because this is the heyday of a segregated economy where if it was going to work, it would have worked at this time. There was very little government intervention. You have these, this um, wage earning black uh, sort of workers in the inner city um, and then the, the white structure, and they're trying to um, build wealth. But what's happening with the banks during this time um, is that uh, the bank deposits are from wage earners, right? Small deposits that are volatile. This is still the case. If, you're, um, if you don't have very much money to put in a bank, the bank doesn't want your um, your uh, goods, right? Banks don't make money on deposits. Banks make money on loans. That's a bank asset. So your liabilities are bank assets. Your assets are bank liabilities. And bank liabilities, so if you have deposits that are small and in and out of a bank, that's m much more overhead for them than if you have $500,000 that you can just keep in the bank so they can lend out using fractional reserve lending, especially in the days pre-FDIC insurance, which this was. So the deposits in these inner city communities are very small and volatile. So the, the banks, um, costs are very high in overhead. The other and more important thing is the, the houses. Um, so uh, what you had in this era, and, and, and you all know so some of the trends here is this um, sort of, you know, uh, the block busting or the integration of the neighborhoods, which would happen between the, the time when the first black family moved in and the last white family moved out, which could be, you know, a few months. Um, so what you had is uh, several sort of middle class uh, black families would buy a house in a you know, white area, and um, they would pay a premium to do so, you know, and some of them had to do it sort of um, uh, under the radar. Um, and then sort of a white mob or um, uh, some sort of, you know, uh, sort of violent uh, response would, would happen. And part of it was um, racism, but a lot of it was property values. Because as soon as the first white uh, black family moved in, you knew that it was going to turn into a black neighborhood. So as soon as 5 to 10% of the block was black, it would flip and the property values would plummet. These were the assets that black, black banks had to deal with. So you have a lot of these commercial banks trying to lend, and all of their mortgages are underwater almost immediately after they lend them. The other problem is the sort of money multiplier effect of banking. And I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not going to go through that, but but it's it's a really fascinating uh, thing that banks can do, which is create money. So when they lend, they um, create deposits in another bank. And insofar as a bank is lending the, through fractional reserve lending, you know something like ten times, uh, you can take a deposit of a hundred dollars and make it a thousand dollars through that lending process. It's a, it's a, it's a process that um, banks have always been engaged in. It's a little bit more complicated now because actually the Federal Reserve just pumps money into reserves right now. Um, so it's even more accelerated. But this is the, the magic of banking, is that it's not actual deposits that are, are the money creation. It's bank loans that create money. Um, black banks could not do this. Um, they got the deposits from black bar, uh, depositors. They lent to black homeowners, but as soon as they bought some asset, because all the assets were owned by whites initially, or, or most of them were, those deposits and loans would leak out of the community, and, and they were kind of stuck in this trap. Anyway, that's nothing compared to, um, so this is Jesse Binga as an example that I use in, in uh, the, the book. Um, very um, great banker. In fact, you know, you have theses and dissertations written about how great Jesse Binga's bank was and, and able to sort of survive in, in um, South Chicago. Um, his bank uh, uh, 
you know, going through his balance sheets, it's clear that he even could not make a profit on the bank. So the bank was um, a ancillary thing to his um, actual you know, profit, which was the, the um, real estate. So he was a, a big real estate broker. Anyway, it's a fascinating story. It's a kind of a tragic one um, if you read the book. Um, so then the New Deal, and as you know, I'm not going to go through it here, but a complete renovation of banking. And I don't know if we have banking people here, but you know, you really um, take, what FDR does is completely take the risk out of banking, right? So those deposits, which were really volatile before and could lead to a run at any moment, the FDIC insurance just says, um, you know, takes the risk out of uh, bank deposits. Um, the, then you have the FHA um, guarantee, which takes the risks out of um, loans, right? So that's how the American mortgage is created, is through the FHA. Um, I call it 363 banking. By law, you pay 3% on deposits, FDIC insured, no risk. And then by law, you pay six, uh, you take 6% in loans. So that's a 3% spread. Both sides are guaranteed by the federal government. And then you're on the golf course by 3 p.m. because banking is basically printing money. Um, and that's how, that's how it sort of led to the golden era of American banking. You've got credit unions and thrift and the famous George Bailey Bank that we mythologize every um, Christmas is, you know, this idea that, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, actually George Bailey's uh, ingenuity. It was FHA um, uh, mortgages that allowed these small banks um, to thrive. Um, but of course, um, you have these red line maps that are risk maps, right? These are not racist maps. These are maps, uh, these, these are underwriting maps. Um, and the way they underwrote them, and, and, and this, is, this crowd is familiar with this, so I won't spend a lot of time, but I usually use Atlanta. This is the Morehouse-Spelman area, the best black neighborhood in maybe the country, definitely in Georgia. And um, as it says, you know, the, these are black businessmen, uh, these are universities, and it's still a redlined um, zone. Because the number one or number two uh, predictor of, of where the red lines would go was, was race. So foreign born, um, black, and, uh, and, and so that, that is the sort of government uh, cementing um, these segregation patterns. And then uh, again, it's about property values, right? So you, you have to have, so we're now not with no, no more mobs and no more bombs. Oh, I forgot to tell you, Jesse Binga's house got bombed like 10 times and he kept rebuilding it, you know? But, but we're beyond bombs now, right? We're at zoning and we're at racial covenants, right? So racial covenants are the way that we protect these green areas so that we can get an FHA um, mortgage. And those racial covenants aren't, um, you, everyone here knows what a racial covenant is, right? It's a contract, you, you cannot sell a house to anyone who's um, not white. Uh, and these are um, enforced up until the 1950s. And even after that, they're taken seriously. Um, Okay, so, um, so something interesting that happens um, during this time also is the FHA consumer credit market that is laid atop of this mortgage credit market. So not only are the white suburbs um, able to build wealth in that home equity that you have, um, and not to mention the GI Bill and that education, but there's also a consumer credit um, boom during this time. So post-war, there's a lot to buy, lots of you know appliances and things like that. And the FHA also has a consumer lending division. It's much less robust than the mortgage one, but it still you know sort of kicks into gear this market through the secondary um, trading of of uh, uh, consumer debt. Um, and what's happening is that in the green and blue areas, in the white suburbs, um, you have revolving credit. And revolving credit is you go to Sears or Montgomery Ward, you buy your stuff through a credit card that's usually issued by the store or some sort of um, a credit that is, re they call it revolving because you pass it over from one month to the next. It's about six to 10% in interest. Um, APR, APR uh, interest rate caps used to be taken seriously before this um, Supreme Court decision in 1978, which eradicated interest rate caps. But you know, you have six to 10% interest. You, um, that, that lender that's giving you the money is able to sell it off to the secondary market, thereby lowering the risk for themselves. That's why they're able to do this. In the black, redlined spaces. Uh, there is no revolving credit um, because the FHA program doesn't work, but also because you know, you've cordoned off the risk. You're, you're putting the, the sort of least um, w you know, wealthy um, and you know, m most sort of like a, a huge wage earning class right in the red um, areas. They're paying more in rent than people in the suburbs are paying for mortgages. And then by then sort of they're starved of that um, 
infrastructure and, 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 and stuff to get actually um, well-paying jobs. So what you have in the red spaces is not revolving credit, but installment credit. Installment credit is night and day from revolving credit. Installment credit is that the person giving you the goods also does the, the loan. So this is like um, rent-a-center. Um, and it's rent-a-center for everything, for like hospital bills, for doctors, for appliances, for everything. And you go to this one shop and they will give you the, the TV, the, the couch and, and whatever, and then they bundle it together. And they're able to get around these usury rates um, through very um, clever um, contracts. And what, what they um, find, you know, when they study this later, and I'll get to that in a second, um, is that um, people inside those spaces are paying five to ten times more for like secondhand used stuff, um, and uh, it's all because of the higher risk. In other words, it is actually not the case that these lenders are predators and um, bad people just making money hand over fist. Ninety-four percent of the charges, the higher charges, are because it's just less. Um, profitable and more risky. They can't sell their um, consumer debt up into the secondary market. They have to keep all of that themselves. They have higher defaults. And when you default, you got to get the repo per people out there and the cops. And it's, it's a really messy lending system. But that becomes sort of the site that the early civil rights movement takes hold. Um, you have uh, you know, Malcolm X and some of the black nationalists and separatists um, talking about, well, why should white people be running these banks and lenders? Um, even Martin Luther King, um, I won't go through it, his early 1954, before, 10 years before uh, the, the, the famous I Have a Dream um, march, he, he, he um, I'm gonna put this back here, um, goes to the black population and says, we've got you know, five goals for our movement. And number one um, was to organize community banks. And number two was to organize credit unions. And number three was to organize sort of economic boycott programs. That was the whole agenda, is that we were going to boycott these lenders and these um, profit makers and, and create some sort of um, pressure point in those areas. Um, and then, of course, his last speech before he's um, assassinated um, is also that. So there's this idea that there's there, the community, the civil rights um, uh, push was against this type of exploitation. Um, so after the, um, the civil rights laws are passed, which, you know, I talk about the civil rights laws are just deregulation. All they do is guarantee the rights of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Um, the next step, as everyone had recognized, was this sort of economic justice, right? How do we fix what's been done um, in these areas? And so you have these um, riots and, and um, violence breaking out all over um, the North um, in these inner cities after the civil rights laws are passed. And people are confused, right? So there's the Kerner Commission that's, that's um, assembled. And the Kerner Commission, you know, is just a devastating critique of, um, of white policies. Uh, he uh, says, um, what white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it. White institutions maintain it. And white society condones it. Um, you have George Romney, Mitt's dad, um, you know, making a presidential run based on uh, sort of integration, right? He says the white suburb is a noose around the black ghetto, um, and only the government can fix it. So he's like pro, you know, pushing for this stuff. Um, but the, the, the whole national mood has shifted uh, by 67, 68, right? Everything, Selma, um, the Martin Luther King sort of speeches, um, the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, all of that stuff is before 1965. Uh, by 1969, you have Johnson out of office, Martin Luther King has been killed, Malcolm X has been killed, Robert Kennedy has been killed, you know, uh, Romney's out of the race, and it's Nixon. And, and so Nixon has this lasting impact on race relations, and I think it's underappreciated, and hopefully we'll talk more about it as we talk about black capitalism, but what Nixon does is say, so there's these two um, serious proposals for reform. One is reparations, or some sort of capital in those inner cities, um, pushed by the black separatists and black power movements, and real sort of detailed agendas for how to restore sort of wealth in these inner cities that were segregated. The other is integration. So MLK, SNCC, um, George Romney, you know, look, you have these segregated areas, let's do something to integrate. And Johnson actually gets the Fair Housing Act passed like days after Martin Luther King is assassinated. This is his last sort of um, uh, part of the civil rights movement. He puts in there that um, that states and, and Congress has the um, 
mandate to affirmatively further the cause of fair housing. Um, and George Romney, I think, is the only HUD, um, Nixon calls George Romney as his HUD administrator, he's the only one that takes that seriously and tries to push plan after plan after plan. Nixon sort of sends him to Mexico within a year and just shuts it all down. Um, but what Nixon does is say, no integration, absolutely no integration. That's, how, that's why he got to office, is, is by his dog whistling on that. No reparations, no capital whatsoever. And he sort of, um, his administration, Alan Greenspan is his economic advisor. You've got some really brilliant sort of new right wing, what we call sort of neoliberal thinking. Um, uh, creates the rhetoric for why not, why no economic redress. And what the rhetoric ends up being is free market capitalism. Um, any demand for justice is anti-capitalist. And you've got the Cold War sort of in the background. You're um, calling all the civil rights leaders communists. I'm getting, um, we'll talk more about this. But anyway, the, the point is that we're still living in Nixon's um, world. Uh, he, he establishes the minority business, OMBE, affirmative action. Um, black capitalism. Black capitalism becomes enterprise zones. So we, we go from calling it a black ghetto to calling it enterprise zones. And what, what else do we call it? Community empowerment, whatever. And then, um, of course, Clinton, uh, Obama doesn't do a lot there. I mean, to his credit and detriment, he doesn't focus on it. And then Trump's opportunity zones and, and tax cuts. Um, it's all very Nixonian. I think there's this direct line um, to that. And it was a decoy. Um, to what could have been meaningful reform. Um, so I think we'll just do Q&A. Thank you for your time. <laughs> I'll put it back. So unfortunately, she had to race through that. Um, <laughs> if you guys ever wonder uh, how it is that areas where distressed neighborhoods, where it appears as though there is a great deal of uh, effort and time and resources poured into it consistently ends up as uh, undercapitalized, underserved, and overpoliced. If you're trying to understand at a really granular level the mechanism by which that happens and the discrimination that undergirds it, I strongly encourage you to pick up her book. It's terrific. Uh, I'm also joined by my good friend and colleague uh, Jamila Michener in the government department. And we're just gonna have a chat about some of the themes that um, emerge from the book. And the first one that I wanted to get you guys to weigh in on um, is the tension that runs throughout the book uh, between uh, uh, securing economic power as a mechanism to solve the problem, the problem being concentrated and enduring black poverty, versus political power, right? So is the solution run through the ballot box or through uh, the dollar? Um, it's a tension that appears throughout history, um, and I'd love it if you guys would weigh in. Okay, so first of all, I just want to sort of reiterate, you should really read this book. I think it's great, and I think about and study and research these things all the time, and I still feel like I learned a lot. You know, I'm a political scientist, so I tend to think a lot about and focus more on how political institutions and power in communities uh, can be a root and a source of change. And in, in that way, I actually found this text pretty, um, pretty challenging in a good way because it made me think about, and I think in a really um, productive way, how sort of constitutive of one another economic and political power are in a way that makes them feel like there's a, it makes it feel like there's a chicken and egg dynamic, right? And so you look at a community and, you know, you see that there are lots of challenges there and it's really clear that something needs to change. And my instinct is to think about what it takes to empower folks who live in that place so that they can be a part of creating change, right? And then I read this and I think about how many levels on which that's difficult be for a couple of reasons. One is because of some of the myths that, that various people, that many people, right, many of us adhere to around capitalism such that the paths that we understand for change are really limited. And so if change is about black ownership or about developing kind of local indigenous institutions and strengthening them, you know, whatever nascent political power people have can be directed towards those ends. 
um, and still not lead anywhere, right? So there, there were plenty of demands for institutions like black banks that political officials like Nixon were content to be responsive to um, that ultimately led nowhere because those institutions were embedded in a context that positioned them for almost inevitable failure. And it, I mean, sort of reading about this really pushed me to think about the deep interconnection between the political and the economic such that I don't actually think it's possible to choose one or even <laughs> prioritize one. I think that they both need to be sort of worked towards simultaneously or else we find ourselves in these pickles where you have what feel like political victories that down the line end in nothing. And then it, it, it sort of advances this narrative. I teach this course on poverty and students, and this will be on the syllabus now. Um, and students say to me all the time, but look at all this money that we've poured into these neighborhoods and look at all the money that we've poured into these poverty programs. And it's still, they still seem the same way. So obviously money can't fix the problem. It, it must be about these communities. It must be about these people. And it's really hard to get across to the students that the money without the power and without the broader economic and political and social transformation, you're right, it doesn't do what we want it to do. Um, and, and this book is really gonna help me to be able to articulate those relationships a little bit more clearly. And I think push me to, to grapple with them and not really end with a solution, mm -hmm. um, but certainly with a better sense of, of how difficult the problems are. Um, okay, so I have uh, several things to, to, to say. On this grassroots, sort of we, um, the, the place where my book kind of makes people on the left mad is that we have this idea that um, these grassroots efforts, right? Um, I've been doing this unbanked, underbanked financial inclusion stuff for years. And one, and I, you know, every time I talk about you know, inequality or whatever, people are like, well, what about credit unions or small banks? And I think there is this, um, you know, again, progressive era and very beguiling and empowering concept that local communities can overcome these structural barriers. And I think that's, that's where this book came from, I mean, my earlier book tries to go at that too, but, but lots of things are better local, right? Food and restaurants and, and you know, all of the, the ways that local you know, uh, organizations understand um, stuff on the ground. Uh, but money and credit and banking is not a local thing, right? Money, money is a federal project. It is a, uh, some, it is a, a denominator of sort of social value that is decided at a high level and these credit programs that either enhance or deprive wealth, these are policy decisions, right? And, and these were debates that we used to have, right? The gold-silver debates, right? Gold is, right? People understood that if we have the gold standard, that enriches certain members of the community because of the, those who already hold gold and the way that the structure of gold ends up enriching some and not others versus silver or fiat currency, right? Which is more expansive and more um, allows for more credit. And so now I think, and this is again, the very neoliberal sort of Milton Friedman monetarism and, and, and a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's really important for those of us interested in structural inequalities to get at these money debates because the problem with the monetarism and, and the Friedman-esque, post-Friedman, sort of neoliberal, Hayek, all of this stuff, is to take money out of the equation, is to assume it away. I mean, we just don't, we focus on the things that money creates and the value created, but we don't focus on money itself. What is money? Who creates it? How is it created, right? When the Federal Reserve bought up $7 trillion of um, junk assets from banks that it's still holding on to about four trillion of that. Where does that money come from? And and who is not getting those resources that the Fed um, holds on to? And so this idea of economic power versus political power. I mean, I think you you it's all um, these structural decisions that are involved. Um, so so this I think um, the the Booker T Washington um, uh, idea, and it's a very um, um, alluring, it's, it's a very attractive idea that, you know, we will, so Booker T. Washington has these things like, look, a white man can't help but respect a black man who owns the mortgage on his house. If you're a black man and you're gonna go in the train car, that's the, the best one, and you walk over around, you know, the white people, they're gonna respect you. And so his, his idea is, look, make money, stay, we don't need integration, we don't need these rights, we're gonna make money, and that we will earn respect. And there is, 
that, that, that goes through some of the separatist thoughts. I mean, I think the Marcus Garvey and the separatists actually wanted sovereignty over their spaces, but the Booker T. Washington promise, which still lingers, is just be successful in your space and, and you will earn that respect. But what happens when black communities historically had um, gained money, right? I talk about the Tulsa um, riot, which was an extermination of a black Wall Street. Um, Tulsa was one of the only neighborhoods, Tulsa and Durham, one of the only neighborhoods that where blacks were making money uh, because of the oil booms. And it was um, just, you know, bombed. Uh, to, and, and these uh, uh, black refugees had to just abandon um, their homes because of that resentment. So no, if, if you own the mortgage on the white man's house, he's probably going to go and join the Klan and, and come after you because you're a minority and your rights aren't protected and your property isn't protected by law. I mean, that sounds grim, but that, that has been the, the historical case. I mean, um, in Georgia, in, uh, North Carolina, I mean, you couldn't buy property and hold on to it if you were um, black because of the way the power um, and political structure was. So, so that's another sort of theme, but this idea that you can gain economic power first and then political power, I want to sort of complicate that and just say, look, economic power, wealth actually comes most of the time from policies, right? The way that the middle class in America gained its wealth um, and the way that the middle class got coded to be white was through government credit policy. It was just through the ex nihilo creation of the FHA guarantee and through the FI FDIC insurance funds. These were public, massive public interventions in the market. Um, and so if we want to talk about capitalism and free markets, I mean, really it's only been the black ghettos <laughs> that have been experiencing capitalism because those are the only places where they had to go search for someone who will lend and take on that risk on their own without these government subsidies. So I wanna, I'm, you know, I, I, as Jamila knows, I come from the school that believes in more of uh, the economic empowerment because I am so skeptical of the capacity of especially the law to achieve genuine um, political empowerment uh, and, and the unwillingness that we have seen for several hundred years to grant that. Um, uh, but one of the lessons of your book is that the inability to create this um, uh, economic empowerment, w w regardless of whether there's a chicken and egg or one does stand independent, you know, the, the fact is everybody recognizes it has to happen if there's gonna be uh, transformational change, um, is the imbrication, the, the, the interlapping between um, uh, black economic enterprise in, in distressed neighborhoods and extractive uh, capital, sources and, and like with the renta centers mm -hmm. right it's, it's not that they are black predators it's that they, they can be ru running a marginal existence marginal profits all their money is going out of the community as well yeah. um, so it gets at to me and I, I was wondering if you could just elaborate uh, in a little bit more detail for folks the relationship between uh, when people talk about free enterprise mm -hmm. um, I always say you know the market doesn't give a damn whether you're married or not mm -hmm. Uh, that's a product of the marriage tax credit. We, we write that in. The market doesn't care uh, about a lot of things you do, but government does, and it incentivizes that. If you could um, elaborate on how the market has retreated in order to create, uh, not retreated, been pushed back, pushed aside, in order to create white wealth, mm -hmm. but exalted mm -hmm. in order to create black poverty, uh, I think that dynamic would help uh, clarify things for people. Yeah, so, so I think that's the Nixonian pivot is, you know, post New Deal, things are breaking down for a lot of reasons. I mean, you have stagflation and people are getting sort of, there's a lot of state intervention. I mean, the Fed was mandating interest rates on banks. It was really heavily state involvement. So there's a lot of trends going at one time. But I, I think, and maybe it's because I got so myopic into this stuff and in the Nixon archives and in the Goldwater um, uh, papers, but I think this, um, the free market rhetoric um, becomes a really useful tool against the civil rights um, push for economic justice. I, I actually think, but for that, and you have the famous Lee Atwater interview, which, uh, you know, by now has um, percolated in several books, but, you know, he says, look, you first you're saying the N-word and segregation and, you know, then you're saying states' rights and tax cuts, but it's essentially the same thing. I think a lot of that capitalism as a weapon is used to cut down those demands where you're absolutely right. It was the federal government, even before the New Deal, through the Homestead Act and through 
Um, lots of other like ways that we break down monopolies or build them up, but especially through the New Deal, creates white wealth. And so when this minority community says, okay, we'll cut us in, it's like, no, that's anti-capitalist, uh, free markets, um, we'll, we'll take care of it. And, and, and yeah, I mean, I talk about markets, like fine, if you want markets, let's do markets. I don't know if we have the stomach for markets, honestly. I think um, uh, there's this great book out just, that just came out called The Outlaw Ocean. And the idea is like, the, the ocean is the place where there's a free market, right? Like, no one regulates these ships out on the ocean. And it is, it is a devastating book. I mean, there are like, actual, like slavery and, and killing of workers. They just, it's, it's awful. I mean, these rapes and all of this stuff that is not being policed, because that's what you kind of get. You get with free markets, you, you, you get someone that gets all the stuff and then gets weapons and then uses it to, to help other people and, or, um, sorry, enslave other people um, and, and gets more money. I mean, markets, right, like you said, don't care about society. Markets, or capitalism just wants capital to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's like its own force. Um, and, and I think on that, uh, the exploitation, what markets did, once we deregulated the banking sector and we said, okay, you know, fr you know, from the New Deal up until the 1980s, we forced banks to be small, community banks, credit unions, and then we let them merge and go after big money. Um, and what they did was go after uh, the, the black spaces through subprime, right? So subprime credit was a market response to a policy that had segregated the communities. Here you have redlined communities that were deprived of mortgage credit and a deregulated banking market that is now after high risk because they can make high profits. And so that, that was a market result. You know, uh, one of the histories that, the history that Jamil and I both teach and, and know very well is the Southern strategy as a response to the perceived um, uh, chaos of the civil rights movement and the free speech movement and the uh, uh, perception of rising crime, reality of rising crime in some places that is a way to uh, retain order. Um, it's not typically thought of as a way to impose a kind of uh, market austerity. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not usually associated with, with the Nixon strategy, and so your book is a great contribution on that piece. Um, the evidence seems to be that the rhetoric of um, law and order uh, was a very deliberate dog whistle. Do you get the sense that uh, Alan Greenspan's rhetoric of the free market was similarly deliberate, or was he, a, a, we know he was a true believer, still is a true believer, but did he understand the, the, the fact that what he was saying was contrary to the benefits that had been given to whites and which drove suburbanization for the last several decades and it was gonna have this disparate impact? Um, I think he's a true believer. Um, I think Greenspan is not uh, sort of unabashed George Wallace racist, but the strategy, and it wasn't, so law and order we talk about as part of the Southern strategy, black capitalism was if not as big but, or a bigger part of that Southern strategy. So Nixon decides that his civil rights plank is going to be black capitalism. And what he does is he takes, he co-ops the, the rhetoric of the black power movement and he has all these commercials and all these speeches. And, and there's actually a memo in the archives. If you go to the Nixon archives, which I suggest you do, it's, I mean, it's a terrible library, but the archives are, Great. Everyone's interested in the Watergate stuff, right? So there's like lines for it. It's all cataloged. But there's this whole treasure trove of campaign materials that I don't, I just, hasn't ever been even cataloged. Nobody looks at it. And there's all of these memos and these rewrites. I mean, they wrote everything down and these conversations between each other. And there's this great memo from Alan Greenspan to Richard Nixon on the riots. And this is in 1966. So before he's even running for president, and, and he gives him, he says, this is how you talk about the riots. He says, these black um, uh, communities are saying that this is exploitation, but it's actually technically not exploitation because they're not making a profit, because it's higher risk and that's capitalism. So he's using true facts, but he's saying, look, just call, any demand for reparation, and it's a specific response to reparations or integration. He's saying, just call it anti-capitalist. And so you see that evolve, um, and then in, in his, um, with his cohorts, the only exception being George Romney, right? Um, but they, they kind of fine tune that campaign message. Um, there's this great ad that I sometimes play when I do the full presentation that 
um, is, is, a, is, is his uh, uh, ad on black capitalism. And there's a line at the end, he says, it's time to go past the old civil rights into the dawn of a new era or whatever. And the first like five drafts said, forget civil rights. Right? And then someone crosses over it and says, move beyond civil rights. And then someone crosses over that and says, it's time to move past the old civil rights. Right? But, but it's specifically like, how do we halt the mo forward motion on civil rights, but not seem like we're doing that? And the way that they do it is black capitalism. They say, okay, so these groups are asking for black power. By the way, the Panthers and those groups that were asking for black power were asking for sovereignty. They, they had linked their movement to an anti-colonialism abroad. So it's not just we want to run black businesses. They wanted to run the black community and the schools and, and just actual have, actually have political power within those spaces. And that was, not a, that was a no go, right? Um, so he, he takes that and I think expertly calls it black capitalism. And then Ford, um, Carter, Reagan, I mean, what's really amazing is that he just picked, I think, I mean, Nix is a genius, right? He picks this perfect, path through uh, civil rights so that you don't have to say you're blocking anything. You're, you're actually, who can be opposed to black business and treasury deposits going to black banks and the OMBE is the Office of Minority Business Enterprise. It's, it's all useless, affirmative action. Nobody lobbied for affirmative action. Nixon just asked these companies to hire more black workers and that's, that's his idea of redress. And then it gets honed and sophisticated over time. And I'm not saying that there are bad guys. I just think that there are things that people want to have happen and then they go for the strategy that makes it the, the best way for it to happen, right? Um, and so I think this is where you have Reagan, his entire civil rights plank in the 1988 Republican platform is tax cuts. That's his civil rights plank, right? And then you have Clinton going that third way um, and saying community entrepreneurship and enterprise and Larry, uh, Lauren Summers saying, you know, you're going to have these CDFIs, these banks being niche entrepreneurs and go like market scouts. Um, Cory Booker, um, not to throw him under the bus, he's not doing great, but he called them domestic emerging economies or domestic emerging markets, the black segregated spaces in, in a propelling opportunity zones. The idea here is you can send entrepreneurs into these spaces and they will cleverly find profits and, by the way, enrich this community. And that's, that's just not going to happen. Can I? Please, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. I'm, I think as this I This is great in an awful sort of way. No, well, I mean, all of that is awful. <laughs> the conversation is great, though. Um, I, I'm sitting here struggling with how to translate the many insights that I think come from the book and that you're sharing with us right now into thinking about what should be happening in communities and neighborhoods on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned sort of really early on that some of the kind of logic that's propelled these kind of historical processes and kind of continuing contemporary processes is really beguiling. It's really mm -hmm. appealing. It means, it, it, first of all, it gives people a sense of power that there are things they can do in their community to create the kind of economic change and freedom that they would like to have. It's local, which means it's more doable. It's really hard to think about what it means from, mm -hmm. you know, wherever, Uniontown, Alabama. I just had some people from Uniontown visit my class yesterday. It's really hard to think about what it means from there to like change things all the way up the line, right? And so how do we think about how to translate these insights into, mm -hmm you know, insights that feel applicable to people who are looking around them, seeing things in their immediate community that need to be changed and wanting to do something to make that change. Does it mean that all of their energy should really be focused on sort of policy shifts at the national level? Does it mean, is it just about expectation management and sort of calibrating, you know, what you say you're going to be able to achieve with the kind of view in mind that there's a ceiling for what you can really do on the mm -hmm. local level? Like, how do you think mm -hmm. about helping us or me or whoever might be interested to reconcile these different levels mm -hmm. of thinking? Um, so I think, I mean, going back to those 1965 to 67 playbooks, like there were, there were, actual legitimate demands on both sort of strains of the, the black movements, right? Um, one saying, you know, again, we're, we're, it's fine to have segregation, 
right? We're, it's fine with it. We've created this, you know, I think the person said before, like this culture, right? This social capital in these places. But that, by the way, now is being hoovered up by the gentrifiers, right? You create this cool community through segregation and now people get to profit off of that, right? But, but there, there was a group saying, look, we actually want to keep these black spaces, but you, those mechanisms that were used to create white wealth, we want to turn them inwards. And so there was all these ideas for like a World Bank type structure within the black spaces and, and other things. Or you can go to the integration aspects, right? Not school integration, because we actually don't integrate schools, because we don't integrate taxes. We just send kids off to schools, and we're not even doing that anymore. I just lived in the South for about seven years, and the schools are completely segregated, not unlike New York City, right, where I was from before that. But, um, you know, I think integration, a meaningful integration would be, you know, actual allowing, you know, having mixed income housing, right? Allowing um, communities to actually create that, right, um, uh, um, wealth building homes in, in, in those areas. Those are things that, that could be done. I mean, look, we know how to build wealth. Um, I think there's a lot that local communities can do. I mean, there's a lot of gra grassroots stuff that works. I think when we're talking about structural changes, I think it does come down to building coalitions and going after political power like they were trying to do in 67. I mean, like the Poor People's March that Martin Luther King was about to have. The Panthers, I mean, the Panthers were really effective at pointing out um, some of the problems. Um, and so I think going back to what they were asking for and then really just um, creating a meaningful uh, political coalition. I mean, I, I have some policy suggestions that I've put in several papers. Um, it takes capital, but it's not, like when we talk about things like reparations or capital, uh, the way that money works, you don't actually have to take it from your pocket and put it into someone else's pocket. You actually, the FHA, the New Deal did not do that. The New Deal created wealth for everybody who was included. And the way they did it was um, through these government supports and these deposits and the bankers got m money, the people who got the mortgages got money, the, the people who served the, the people in the suburbs um, profited. Uh, it works if you can sort of get all the pieces right. So I think it's not actually that difficult to create wealth in these spaces. I think we have to sort of think more broadly about um, who is included in the sort of we that we're creating wealth for. I think we, so many of us, and this goes to like the rhetoric, I think so many of us are okay with some schools being bad schools and some neighborhoods being violent neighborhoods and others being places where we would like to live. And, and sort of in our mind saying, well, someone should go to that bad school, but it's not my kid. And, and I think that, that stuff is um, the stuff that we, we just all, like at an individual and local level, have to get over. Um, and then schools are a great way to start on the grassroots. You know, just ask people like, well, who, whose kid should go to that school that is underfunded, where kids have to get, you know, um, walk through, threats of violence to get in. Um, whose kid should go to that school, um, if not your kid? Um, so in the zombie property space, municipalities have had a really interesting resource, which is holding fairly substantial amounts of acreage of land. And I'm just wondering if you could think about creatively how um, local governments and or NGOs might think about using that resource to address some of these structural pieces. Yes, so I actually um, have a policy paper on exactly that. It's called the 21st Century Homestead Act. And what I talk about is these land banks and other holdings. And even in places like Detroit, where it's all sucked up by private equity, I would favor just using the takings power, you know, eminent domain, and just buy, you know, giving them just compensation, bringing those back, and then using, and I think that you'd, you, would need, you would want to plug into a federal uh, money, um, but through a bond structure, so not grants or appropriations, but to release homestead bonds into the market. Um, and like the, I don't know if you know the, about the financing of the Import Export Bank, but this is bank that works, it, it needed an, an initial grant of money, and then it just can sell bonds and float itself. So I would say that. So you take all these properties, you get the bond to redevelop them, hand them over. Um, equity, not, not land trust, right? So you get this property holistically to the, you know, anyone from formerly redlined communities or in that community, and then wait 10 years. Watch as the community you know, uh, revitalizes. I mean, there's a public works 
part to this as well. I mean, trying to sync up. I mean, there's a lot of these, um, you know, VA hospitals and opiate centers and, and defense department. It's like pork that congressmen get for their districts, putting some of that in those areas and then allowing that sort of natural thing. It's, I go through the details of it. Um, you know, it's something like that I think would work. A municipality itself could do it through a partner um, that sort of well capitalized, um, but it'd have to be, you know, someone who was willing to wait, not not a, an immediate turnaround. And I think that's the problem with capitalism is capitalism is not particularly, you know, long term. It's Asian. pretty short sighted. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Tarka Bell is in the Center for Community Progress. This kind of follows the last two questions, so mm -hmm. if there's not much more to add, but I love how you described that, uh, you know, Greenspan's decision to use free market capitalism as a decoy mm -hmm. from any meaningful reform for economic and racial justice. So that has certainly had staying power with both Democrats and Republicans. We finally see some conversation about reparations mm -hmm. in the presidential uh, campaign, which is great. So. As an expert, if the next president were to say, here's a trillion dollars, what are some of those ways in which you could kind of embed reparations within this community development space? Mm -hmm. And who else in the field is thinking, you think most innovatively and creatively about that for those who are policy geeks and want to study it more? Yeah, great question. So I, um I'm actually advising several of the candidates on their programs. Um, so, so I, you know, I think I, um, I would say focus on housing, I mean, is, is a big one. Um, and also just, um, you know, student debt, just debt and, and credit relief um, and, and in the ways that we have done it before. But, but I do want to talk about reparations in general. Um, so uh, we talk about, we, when we talk about reparations, we get to like, everyone stop, you know, go, wants to go to step four and say, oh, it's just not workable. How does, how, how, you know, you can't just give a check to everyone, right? I, I think we need a step one two, three, before we get to step four or five or whatever that step is. And step one has to be something like a truth and reconciliation, right? Like what the Kerner Commission tried to do. Step two might be measuring, measuring extraction, measuring deprivation, measuring the gap. Um, and then step three, we could talk about like who are the parts, like how, who's involved in this program. And then step four would be like actually enacting it. And that's where everyone wants to like stop the conversation because it's not possible. So there's um, one of the models here. Um, so there's this, there's, there's this organization, I think created by Reagan, uh, one of the neoliberal presidents, uh, called the OMBE, the Office of, um, sorry, not the OMBE, the, um, the, the budget, OMB. Yeah, yeah. OMB. Um, that says every um, agency, anytime you have a rule, you have to put it through this OMB process. Like what are the costs and what are the benefits? And so you just created this agency where everything you do has to be filtered through this. There's, there's a couple of programs like that, right? I would say, if, like, if I were just like the person inventing reparations, I would, I would say, here's the mandate. We have this racial wealth gap, close it. Um, be creative, I don't care how, how you do it, um, but every agency in the federal government has to come up with a plan for how all the stuff that they do um, close the racial wealth gap. And then you come in and you measure it, six months to a year. Could be, I mean, the, there are so many, the DOJ, the CFPB, these banking regulators, um, um, they don't take banks to um, court anymore. They take these huge fines. So like JP Morgan does massive fraud and instead of taking them to court, they knock them $7 trillion or billion dollars, $7 billion, right? Wells Fargo, you were racist in your subprime, you know, $10 billion, something like that, right? What, what are you doing with those fines? Um, put, put them to work in, in those areas that you, um, that you preyed upon instead of putting them back into the agency's coffers. I mean, I think there's a lot of ways um, to do this if we wanted to. Um, I think there's, there's a lack of political appetite. And I think part of that is just having a majoritarian democracy, having that sort of populism baked into the constitution in some ways. I mean, I think we, not enough ways, obviously, because we have the electoral college, but, but I think sort of convincing enough people that it is a benefit to all of us to get this sort of you know, original sin, to get this blight out of our um, democracy. Because it is, it, if, if it infects all sorts of organizations. I mean, t the tax base, the school districts, everything has got to work around this, I think, this horrible thing that has been done over and over again. So I think it, you know, maybe making a, a moral appeal, but also a practical appeal, right? We have another question in the back, but I wondered if Jamila or Joe wanted to follow up on 
No, go ahead. Uh, did you want to weigh in? I, I, well, so I actually have to leave now, but I did want to say, um, I, I, I love hearing about these ideas and I do love the spirit of the question in terms of, uh, so I want to re sort of um, enforce the spirit of the question, which is, imagine we did actually have resources. Imagine we could actually do something. What would we do? And I also want to sort of push the need to think about that like across levels, right? So that's, imagine that we had, you know, a president that said, what could we do with this trillion dollars to make uh, to minimize the, the racial wealth gap, but you know, in a particular state, in a particular commute county, in a particular neighborhood, you know, imagine that we elected someone who was willing to devote X share of resources to diminishing, you know, structural inequalities and, and racial inequity. What would we do? And I think beginning with that kind of what I would call radical imagination, and then reverse engineering, right? Both, you know, in terms of policy, like, you know, like you said, there's steps one, two through four. Let's not start at four. Let's actually try to start at one and imagine and think through that. But also in terms of the how to create the political pathways that make this possible, right? So that it's not just imagining, but it's about what are the small things, right? It's, Thinking through, for example, one, one thing I study, which is feedback processes. What are the small things that we can do now that aren't transformational enough, that will not satisfy you know, the needs that, as we understand them, but that will do something that will create more possibilities in stage B or stage two, so that we can then do other things that are maybe a little less small, and then that creates more possibilities and so on and so forth. Can we, and while I, I am inclined towards thinking transformationally. Let's just change everything now, all of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also realizing that it often doesn't feel like that's possible on the national level or on any level. How can we sort of think strategically about creating or promoting policies and practices that will generate feedback, both feedback that's economic, that we can help people to benefit in small ways. Maybe that means we can mobilize them and advocate for benefit in larger ways, but also feedback that's political, right? If we can have a small policy victory or a local political victory, then that can build on itself, right? Because all of the kind of big radical things we have to imagine, but then they open space for us to think about how we can get there on a more micro level. And then on that note, I unfortunately have to run, but this has been great. Yeah. Thanks, so Jamil. is there a question in the back? There? Yes. Thanks, Jamila. Thank you so much. Another question back here. Hi, uh, it's Olga Murawski, Greater Mohawk Valley Land Bank. Um, a lot of the things you're speaking about, we see in uh, Utica, which is part of our region where we're coming from with this investment. Um, and it reminded me of a, a story in the national press a couple years ago about um, Oakland, you know, the home of you know, the Black Panthers where they got started. Um, and how they were looking to make a, a major investment in road improvements in some of the most distressed neighborhoods, some of which hadn't seen repaving in 30 and 40 years. And it was a big, ambitious push, but what happened is, is the more affluent neighborhoods then pushed back mm -hmm. and demanded to recapture some of that money for maintenance projects mm -hmm. in their neighborhood. So I guess where I'm going is I think it's a very positive thing to Tarek's point that uh, reparations is now on the national uh, uh, candidates' uh, mouths and, and, and we're hearing more about it. But I really think the issue is in an informed group like this, we know about redlining, we know about this inequity with the banking, and we've heard these things, but both with the African American and also the Native American community, how do we make it so the social justice and the public relations side um, can be more spoken about in a way that the common person, where we recognize in our, in our area, often the rural white poor have very common issues, but going all the way back to Haiti and their uh, independence struggle, where the, the upper classes spread them apart mm -hmm. so that they wouldn't share those common goals against capitalism. Mm -hmm. I mean, you actually don't need to go back to Haiti. You can go to the US South post um, reconstruction to see the splitting up. I mean, there really almost was a populist party of um, sharecroppers, white and black, that were going after sort of the oligarch, the cotton powers in New York, 
right? And, and you know, the Republican Party was kind of inert in that fight, but the Democrats, to beat the populist coalitions, gave white supremacy to the white, white um, uh, poor, and, and that was effective, but, but not obviously self-serving. But, but, but I think, you know, coming to your like nimbyism and, and um, you know, the opportunity hoarding or call it what we will, I mean, I think we're all implicated in this. I mean, I think we all, like every time we go look for a house, our schools, there's so much of this stuff where we want to advocate for national things, but like on a local level, you know, don't take my taxes for those roads, you know, school, schooling is huge, I think, and part, part of it is because I have children in school, but this is where you see those, you know, Im implicit or explicit race preferences being, um, ad, uh, you know, done by all sorts of well-meaning liberal parents who really don't want to integrate their schools and, and really don't want their taxes to go um, to those schools. And, and, and one of the solutions here then is, look, if we're not gonna integrate people or kids, just integrate the tax code, right? Take all the taxes, shake them up, and distribute to schools individually, right, per student, as opposed to property values, right? I mean, this is just one of those places where that inequality gets baked in. There's many things like that, right, where that local tax structure really ends up thwarting any efforts at um, economic justice, right? You, you have to, the taxes have to be seen, or the borders of what your locality is can just be large, even if you do it at the state level. You know, the state of New York could shake up its taxes. And I mean, can you imagine? Like, that would be transformative. I mean, New York is a special state, but there's a lot of states that are like this now. In Georgia, right, you've got these money centers and then the rest of the state, you know? And, and we used to say, I grew up in New York, um, and I, grew, I went from New York City to the Hudson Valley, and, and it felt like, you know, it was like New York City, and then the rest of the state was like Alabama, uh, which is what someone described it to me, and it felt a little bit like that, you know? Um, and, and I think you're seeing that in a lot of places in California, where I live now. You've got LA, San Francisco, you know, some coastal places, the rest is Alabama. And by Alabama, I mean, you know, red state and all of that, that, that comes with it, including some of the race um, stuff. And so I think, you know, shaking that up on a state level could even work. Hey, uh, David Hunter with LISC. Um, just curious, uh, uh, what your opinion on uh, tax credits as vehicles to uh, perhaps, you know, race neutral, implicitly race neutral vehicles to uh, increase, um, opportunities in low income communities. And, and so in particular, the low income housing tax credit, mm -hmm. which is what we use mm -hmm. today to, to develop most affordable rental housing mm -hmm. in the country, but also the, um, the home ownership tax credit that mm -hmm. Helene mentioned earlier, uh, which is legislation pending. I mean, we have, we have a regressive tax tax system. I mean, home ownership tax credit, the five one c the the college funds. I mean, we really. I mean, our tax our tax code benefits the middle class, and then you've got the opportunity zones that benefit um, really you know higher uh, levels. I mean, you have the earned income tax credit. You do have some taxes that that are progressive, but I think. You know, you you have to look. I mean, I've, I've been seeing a lot of these debates about oh, 90 percent of the taxes are paid for like by the top, um, but these don't include you know payroll taxes and sales taxes and all of the tax cuts that go to property owning people and to um, private equities and you know getting these special tax cuts. So I, I just think even just making it completely a progressive, getting rid of all of that stuff, and obviously politically that's a nightmare. I mean that's. Like removing the mortgage tax credit is, is a political non-starter. But maybe adding a rental tax credit or and more making EITC bigger, because EITC has actually been proven to be pretty useful. That money goes um, to something, right? Um, so I think, yeah, the tax system is where it all starts. And this is like, I, I'm always on my soapbox about this stuff with my law students, but we have a lot of um, people that come to law school that want to do public interest and good for the world or any school. Um, and then you have the people that want to come and do money and make money, right? And it's fine, right? But the people who want to make money go and focus on finance and corporations and tax. And the people who want to do social justice focus on the softer, um, more human stuff. And I, I just think we need more sort of social justice or call it what you will, progressives mucking around in the tax code. Like know the tax code and make that your battle. It's not sexy, right? Or banking. There's just so few people who know 
banking regulation or, or finance at a granular level who advocate for you know, uh, progressive positions because it's just we self-sort so early. So as educators here, I think it's really important to push our students toward that stuff and, and you know, hope that they don't lose their soul, but they, they won't, you know? Um, you know, I think I, I was radicalized on Wall Street. I was a banking attorney. I mean, I was like pretty left before then, but just being a banking attorney and seeing, I was there from 2005 to 2010, and seeing the Fed create this money and these vehicles, and I, I was at the firm that created all this stuff, and it's like, oh, all these things that we tell ourselves about markets and banks and market discipline and where money comes from was bunk. And I saw it. And, and so, you know, and I think a lot of people in that space got radicalized at the time. I don't know if you know Saleh Amarova. She was yeah. at my- uh, she's my could, colleague. She's your colleague at the law school here. She was at my, my same firm. And we both were just kind of like, this is, this is crazy. Um, and, and the bankers and the Fed regulators were very explicit about, yeah, we're just gonna create this money and, and suck it up. And it's better to save the banks for the economy than it is to do home, homeowner relief. And I bought it at the time. Um, and, and I think we all did. We're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. We get the banks back up and that'll help everyone, everybody, right? Um, and it, it didn't. You know, Sorry, real quick, right here. You, I know you focus, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense that uh, this is federal issues, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are federal regulations mm -hmm. regarding financing and banking and what have you. What can be done at the local or state level, which I think is much more accessible to mm -hmm. people here, right? Mm -hmm. Even at the state level, it's a different beast as well. But are there places where communities, either local governments, county governments, state governments are you know, making some inroads, doing what they can given mm -hmm. the limitations of the system? Yeah, I mean, right, there's a lot of things that are actually just state power. So even in banking, you have state regulators and you have federal regulators, but, but only states have power over usury. Right. And New York has actually been great on, you know, going after. I mean, you had like some um, attorney generals who got taken down by other issues, but um, who were really stalwart against this. And, and, you know, you have like three states that go after usury. New York is one of them. And it, there's this legacy of that fight. A lot of the early civil rights fights were Harlem and the New York state legislators, there's this great new book called um, City of Debtors by my colleague Ann Fleming. And she kind of catalogs that New York state um, fight on interest rates that then went national. You know, you, sh you create a model. I mean, this is something that's coming up again. I mean, interest rates are now like crazy, right? And there's so many loopholes. And, and it's this, you know, um, tug of war, this cat and mouse chase between states on usury and then, and then banks trying to skirt them and going to states where there are no usury caps like Utah and Idaho and then exporting their rates. But you have states like New York really kind of heading that off and fighting that. And so I think that, and then, and then to the extent that the states could offer alternatives, again, the credit union movement, the thrift movement, all those started in New York. Um, New York actually has a great legacy of fighting against um, loan sharking and all of that stuff. It's harder now, um, but you know, there's certainly a lot of great historical efforts. And I, I am not a fan of the credit union or the thrift as a means of, um, you know, fixing these issues, and I, I talk about why, but I think there are ways to go after, you know, payday lenders and title lenders, because these, these, these institutions are still extracting, like he was saying, that extractive economy. I mean, you look at who's in debt, who gets out payday loans, who pays way more interest. It's the black and brown communities, it's the rural white communities also, who pay more for the same amount of credit than the rest of us do who have bank accounts, who pay to cash their checks. They pay 10% of their income if you don't have a bank. And most of New York State is now a banking desert because of the conglomeration. So if you don't have a bank in your vicinity, you, you gotta go to a check casher. And those are the, that industry is booming. So you know, going after them, but also as you go after them, offering an alternative, because you have to get that check cashed. You, know, you, need, you need someone to do those services. So um, nonprofits, there's o a few Oakland nonprofits that are doing just check cashing. Right, just little things that are like so again unsexy, but that are huge. Like just putting money back in the pockets of people who shouldn't be paying. I mean, nobody should be paying 10% of their income just to use their money or pay their bills. Getting your water office, your electricity office, to take cash or to do some means of, of, of payment for those goods that is not doesn't require people to have to take their paycheck, put it into cash put it into a money order, all of that takes money. And these are things that only poor people do. And so the policymakers just don't think that, that it's a huge issue, but it's a huge issue. 
Um, it's a huge issue. This is money just being siphoned off of the people and then subsidizing the rest of us, right? Those of us who have credit cards and get points and pay off our balance each month, that's coming from people who can't pay off their balance and have to pay interest to, to uphold that debt. So, so there are ways in which, you know, just little, the little scraping off can be stopped. Are we short on time? How are we doing? Yeah. yeah we, I think we need to wrap up. So All right. Thank you very much, Mercy. Thank you.